Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Anna Castle, Director of Marketing at Advisacon, and really glad you're with us today. I want to tell you just a little bit about Advisacon for those of you who aren't familiar with us. We've been in the project and portfolio space for over 20 years. We're a gold project partner with Microsoft and have several MVPs on staff. We're really excited you're here today. Uh, we have a little bit of a different format as uh, we have two of our experts uh, joining us for today's session. And this will just be a little sampling of the expertise we bring to the table as we like to think of ourselves as your project management one-stop shop. We have a variety of ways for you to engage with us, uh, ranging from consulting, training, to even some tools and books that we've created to make your life easier. With that, one quick note about this session. We welcome your questions and input. Uh, if we aren't covering something that uh, you are curious about, feel free to utilize your question section in the control panel showing on your screen. We're going to do our best to address those during our time today. If not, we're going to we'll, please submit anyways and we will uh, follow up right after the session. With that, let's not delay any further and get to the meat of why you are here. It's my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Tim Runcy, Advisacon President, and Bob Bondarouk, our Senior Project Advisor. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Anna, and uh, welcome everyone today. Bob, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Now, I know not everyone gets to have the uh, video cam. We, we are recording these sessions, so that's kind of a uh, process that we'll be looking at putting these things out for people to consume on our website, I think also on our YouTube channel. And, but I will turn on my webcam, and hopefully I'll pop up there. Uh, for those of you that have been to many of these, you may have remembered uh, I was uh, heading out for vacation, getting my what I call my grizz on, and <laughs> going into the grizzly atom mode. And so I'm back, and I've got Bob here. This is the Tim and Bob Show. And we're going to be talking about the importance of requirements gathering uh, around project program and portfolio technologies. And we're going to highlight specifically uh, Visio. I think it's going to be a good session today. And I'm just wondering how come Bob's head on the uh, PowerPoint is much bigger than mine. He's got just much more space than I It's <laughs> because I have a really big head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about our agenda just briefly. But just for those of you that have not met us before, uh, Bob and I both have been doing project and uh, PMO work uh, since the 1990s. Uh, we are deep and steeped in technology, helping to automate process. So uh, as part of AdvisorCon, we support PMI, we teach collaboration, classes, um, we do consulting, so hopefully this will be enjoyable and entertaining for you today. Uh, Bob and I will both be drilling into a couple different key parts there. So I'm going to kick us off today talking about the importance and methodology around requirements gathering. And you're going to find a little bit about, uh, we've written books on it, built tools, uh, have a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time in this area, so we'll talk about uh, best practices around this. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to be cherry picking, so there's a lot of content that uh, we certainly could drill into. Um, I'm just going to kind of pull some what I think the key highlights, lead you through a little bit of the best practices, and then set Bob up to do a slam dunk with Visio uh, and talk about why it's such a great tool, why we use that, and then um, he's going to get in and do some uh, demos for us. Uh, Bob, you've got a couple demos planned, right? Yeah, I've got two demos, one on a swim lane and one on a wireframe. Okay. Uh, for those of you that haven't used those, yeah, they, they are good, definitely. Uh, and then finally, we'll do some Q&A. Uh, we'll kind of hold some Q&A to the end, but as Anna said, please uh, post questions that you do have. We want to make sure that if we can't answer some of these, these are helpful. And again, uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We do answer uh, questions via email as well, um, and then uh, to have classes around some of these. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about uh, requirements uh, gathering and some of the technologies around that. Um, this is funny because uh, I actually had to reach out uh, back about 10 years ago to uh, Scott Adams who uh, basically created Dilbert and uh, get permission to use this in our book. But I love this uh, uh, graphic uh, cartoon talking about the importance of requirements gathering and how most people really, uh, especially if you're in a PM position, try and dig into that. So here we clearly have a lady asking, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? The customer says, I'm trying to design my software. 
And uh, she said, well, well, why are you trying to do that? And he said, I won't know what I can accomplish and tell me what you can tell me what the software will do. And they go back and forth. And finally, at the end there, can you design the software to tell me my requirements? So people really struggle inherently with uh, getting through requirements. And uh, I just want to say this is so important in project program and even in portfolio planning is that we begin looking at what are we trying to accomplish. Uh, in fact, let me just tell you, I think this is one of the most important things in project management specifically uh, is getting your requirements right. So let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, you can see here we've got flowcharts that Microsoft has asked us to build and put on their website. Uh, you have uh, flowcharts around the best practices, books, tools, technologies, but remember what are we trying to do when we do a project? It really is the requirements. And so if you fail to get requirements clear, documented, analyzed, what you're going to find is you're going to have a faulty product. And so this is so important to go through and manage. So what I'm doing is going to pick a little bit of uh, something that we do in a, a full, uh, we have a class around this with a simulation and interaction. It's a lot of fun, but I'm going to kind of pick the uh, high level pieces and I've kind of highlighted here. I won't be drilling into each and every one of these in its full detail, but I'll talk about some of the process in requirements clarification and requirements gathering. Uh, so first off, you know, you're going to be starting out with, hey, the project's approved. And then you move into an elicitation phase. And there's a lot of techniques inside of elicitation, and I won't get to those, but what I wanted to do is kind of scrape some of the frosting off for you and talk about what are some things that you should really be asking for. And so here's a nugget, just for those of you that are out there doing requirements gathering, whether you're using tools or not using tools, is that you want to set yourself up to clearly get to what the requirement is. So in this case, it just says differentiate between a solution and a requirement. And what that means is a lot of times the customer will tell you, hey, this is my solution. And the solution is, is I need, uh, I need this to work on Windows, or I need to work, have this work in a relational database uh, that's coming from Oracle. And, and I think that's a, a good statement, at least they're thinking through that, but truly, what's the difference between a solution and a requirement? And so part of it is, is instead of them understanding and thinking of proposing a solution, you want to drill to what is the requirement. And we use something called triplet questioning to help you dig into that. So, hey, what's your requirement? Hey, I want this to work from Oracle. Great. Uh, sounds like a solution to me, but really what are you after? What a value does that give you? And that second step right there, that triplet questioning, what does that give you a value? helps people think through surfacing what truly is the requirement. And chances are you're going to have that actually uh, present more requirements as they dig deeper and dig deeper. And then finally, uh, question number three here, which is which value is most important? And if you think about that, what are we doing is we're setting the stage for people to surface requirements and then begin to help you prioritize those by setting their priorities. And as we begin looking at leveraging Visio um, as a wonderful flowchart, you know, diagramming tool, sometimes we're going to be looking at processes going, hey, you need to pick. And as a, a, a business analyst or a project manager working through this process, you definitely want to be able to have the customer start giving you those priorities. Yeah, Tim, another strategy for that is uh, there's this thing called the five whys, and it's just you got to ask why five times till you get to the actual real reason people are doing something. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if we don't ask five times, we will never get the truth. They'll keep giving us the solution. Why? <laughs> Why? They want. They've already decided it in their head what it is. Yeah, it's almost like sales. Like you got to keep knocking on the door seven times before someone actually realizes that, you know, that they are interested or they they do have a, a real need for something. So perfect, great. Uh, let me move beyond elicitation because there's a lot there, but I'm going to spend our time. I think this is really where we're going to see Visio really shine is the analysis, the document documentation, and the verification. Uh, these just really uh, scream the need for visualization. And so you hear the term, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. I, I think that's cheap, right? I think that's just uh, really a picture is worth so much more, especially when you communicate complex uh, elements. So as you begin taking, gathering those requirements, you move into what we call analysis. And part of that analysis is really you're going to kind of model these complex or unclear requirements. Uh, Bob, I think you said it well, right? You know, you have to keep asking why, 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 and they have to begin thinking through why that's there. So the minute we start leveraging some visual picture, a diagram, a flowchart, it starts to help make things clear 
And I know that we've seen this in a lot of our customer engagements where people will map out their processes or they want to build automation or workflow between SharePoint and another system. And what we typically find is that they have a lot of manual processes duplicating the exact same thing. So leveraging that. So a couple of things here, just uh, model complex unclear requirements in the elicitation. Um, you want to evaluate the feasibility of that requirement. So just because it is a requirement doesn't necessarily make it feasible. And so there's some tools around how to evaluate the feasibility of what that requirement is, what is actually going to take to deliver it, and the clarification of that. And then again, we're back to prioritization because remember we're trying to figure out what we can do within scope, schedule, budget. Bob, anything uh, you want to add here? Oh yeah, so I was thinking about feasibility. One of the things people never ever kind of consider is oh, what's the cost of that requirement, right? So when you get farther on in your model, you can actually start having choices. So okay, this requirement here is going to cost me fifty thousand dollars, and this requirement here is going to cost me one million dollars. Well, maybe it's not a requirement at one million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, but that's way farther down once you've actually kind of gotten to what are my requirements. That's more about prioritization. Absolutely. Well, let's get into some of that because I've got some tools. I'll show you a couple simple tools. We'll talk about approaches around that as well. And uh, again, we could be here all day, but I know we've only got an hour. So uh, again, around through that elicitation analysis, we begin to move through the documentation. So again, we take these models, maybe we've created these diagrams, and we convert them into what we call use cases where we start flagging what's called functional or non-functional requirements. And uh, as far as functional and non-functional requirements, in my opinion is, um, you know, the idea is, is it, do I have to have it to make it work or is this something that is um, esoteric, meaning it, uh, it's the color, the look, the feel, uh, those are maybe components we call non-functional. But in general, the idea is you want to get to what the requirements are, call them out, establish a naming convention. You, you literally are going to be treating these like children. They're going to have names. They're going to have IDs. You're going to have conversations around how you're trying to deliver that. And if you're bringing in vendors, this is very common, is they need to be trying to de deliver to that uh, uh, requirement. So you want to document relevant facts and assumptions. And, and Bob, I don't know if you run into this as well, but uh, a lot of times people will say, here's all the requirements, but then what they didn't put were the facts uh, that supported that requirement, or I'm also assuming this, and that tends sure. to be real big show biters. Uh, or, yeah, the assumptions uh, are always buried, right? They don't even think about them. They've just got them in their head, and they're, they're, they're just in there. So the, right. the, the visualization, yeah, it, it just puts it on the table forces that conversation, and that's what we want to have. Yeah. So again, uh, at the bottom here, you see where it says, give all requirements a unique uh, identifier. Trust me, I, I literally uh, I, I bag and tag these things, and so it's requirement 47, and everyone talks about 47 versus a lengthy descriptive name. But uh, inherently thinking through that process, we want to make sure we get to a place where it's captured and documented. So yeah, in that cases process, for me yeah, are critical. Mm -hmm. and if, if you do software development, use cases for me are critical in just figuring out when you're done because, you know, the users will just keep coming up with changes and changes and changes, but at some point you can use the use case to say, well, it does this now, so we're done. If, if any more changes to it are really enhancements, mm -hmm. and, right? And, and you can float along forever in kind of an operational support mode on a project if you don't have clear use cases that will tell you when you've completed this particular function that people are looking for. Exactly. Again, remember, uh, you know, we don't want a gold plate. We definitely want to put a fork in it. You know, delivering on time, on schedule, on budget is really important. Again, if you have a parking lot of prioritized requirements, uh, you can always add things if you have more time. But uh, you just don't want to be in a position where, you know, where most projects are scrambling after the fact to deliver less <laughs> value or less features than what was originally planned. Uh, documentation, uh, let's just talk about this high level and then I'll, I'll just uh, uh, briefly dig into this. So uh, I've seen requirements on 3 by 5 cards, I've seen requirements on napkins. Uh, here's an example of a requirements record and I'm going to call out a couple things here just if you look through the uh, requirement itself. Is it, it's got an ID number. Sometimes you may want to start cataloging your requirements, whether they are you know, engineering requirements or it's uh, associated to uh, interface or it's back end or it's performance. Uh, depends on how many requirements you're getting, but it gives you an idea of what you have a type classification. And then you notice up in the corner there, it just says event or use case. Again, reinforcing what Bob said is that, hey, I've got something that reinforces how this will be used as well as how I can measure that it's done. So uh, looking at description and business case, 
um, I usually use the term fit criteria. I know that this requirement is met and here's exactly a fitness criteria or a fitness test to make sure that happens. Um, I, I'm going to have us zero in in the middle there. I want you to look at something where it says satisfaction. Um, many years ago, we found that uh, in talking to <laughs> stakeholders, everybody wanted their requirements, right? So they're going to tell you on a scale of one to five, how important is this? It's a five. Everything's important, right? <laughs> well, okay. At some point, you have to start paring down or prioritizing. So what I encourage people to do is ask the dissatisfaction section, right? Well, how dissatisfied will you be? if you don't get this. And so on a scale of one to five, five, I gotta have it, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, if I don't get it, man, eh, moderately unhappy. So you can quickly have a juxtaposition between satisfaction and dissatisfaction to help you identify <laughs> what is that priority. Uh, again, you'll notice it's uh, got a history, it's date stamp, when was it updated, and if there's any supporting materials. And again, this is going to set the stage back to where Visio is going to be showcasing components or elements that need to be addressed by this particular requirement. Bob, there's um, certainly more we can go into. Any thoughts uh, that you have? Yeah, my experience with requirements is they're usually either, it's like you said, it's a five and everybody's got to have it, or it's a zero or a one and it's optional and, and it kind of sits there and it's a nice to have and, and they'll just kind of consider it. But I, I like your satisfaction thing because that gets you to the real question of, well, how much do you really want that? And, and it forces them to, to kind of numerically go after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's and another trick you can use is um, high and low prioritization. So pick one thing that's high and then ask them, well, what's the thing that's at the bottom? And, and sometimes they don't know what's in the middle, but they know the tops and the bottoms, and that, that can kind of sort you out to the middle stuff. And, and, and then you know to go after the highs, right? And you know mm -hmm. not to do the bottoms, and, and you can maybe let the middle stuff float a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it definitely it gives a little bit more of an agile feel to moving through this. So. Uh, the screen that I have up is an example of a database that we built uh, that says, hey, look, if you get a lot of requirements, yes, you could put them on a 3 by 5 card. People put them in spreadsheets, but it's nice to be able to sort, filter, or literally have a form you can go through here. And in this case, we're using a database with a form interface to you know, store it either in SharePoint or create a list of fitness to criteria, categories. And so you click on the left, and it gives you options on the right to fill out. Again, don't have to make this complex, but the idea is there is key information uh, you want to get to. All right, verification, let me just kind of wrap up here because I think this is really the idea is that you've gone through this elicitation analysis, you've documented, you got to go back to the stakeholder and say, is this what you said? This is what I heard you say, is this exactly what you have? And in many cases, uh, this gets me out of a lot of hot water with my wife, <laughs> come back and say, well, this is what I heard, honey, <laughs> is this really what you were saying? And so having that uh, iterative loop is going to be important to bring that to, to bear. And there are tools that you can use to surface different types of, of valid, validation and verification. So we've documented it, we go back and verify with the stakeholders, and as you can see here, the uh, verify may drop down and say, look, I didn't get it right, let's go back through and requirements, uh, do some elicitation do some analysis, we'll document it, and we go through a loop to make sure you've got that. Having a picture is going to scream uh, just, uh, it, it really is visual, and so people will look at it, they'll think about it, and they'll usually find things that are missing. So there's a couple tools I'll just add here, and uh, Bob uh, will reinforce kind of we talk about that traceability matrix, but if you're going to run your requirements, you may want to find when requirements are in conflict, right? So we have rows and columns, requirement one, requirement one, column and row. We're looking for things that either support or conflict against each other. Again, you could do this in a spreadsheet, which we do. Um, there's a lot of ways to make this work, but inherently you're looking for requirements that you can't meet because they're in conflict or they're definitely supporting. Again, that surfaces the prioritization of what you want to work on first. Uh, Bob, I'm, I know you've used tons of traceability matrix. Here's another one, use case traceability matrix, where people can actually see which use cases are supporting the requirements. And clearly you can identify requirements that aren't supported by use cases, meaning that maybe it really isn't a requirement. Bob, yeah, any one comments? I use a lot is, well, one I use a lot that we don't really have a picture of is, is kind of a roles and responsibilities matrix. And so you can say, okay, who in the organization is responsible for this particular requirement? And then that way you know who is going to sign off on it. Because it's really important to know who's testing and signing off on things because if, if, if you don't know who's, who's going to sign off, how are you ever going to get to the completion criteria, right? Yep. 
like the RACI matrix, or some people have a RACI matrix, but the idea is that we've got clear delineation. Who owns it? You know, there might be some people supporting and delivering, but who's owning it, making sure it's getting done. Also, uh, you know, basically who uh, inherently surfaced that requirement. I want to come back to and make sure I validate that uh, as we go through. Well, we've got demos to do, so I want to make sure we don't leave any, uh, we skimp on time for Bob to show you some pretty rock uh, solid stuff in Visio. But I'm going to wrap up with uh, an element here, which is we call the requirements completion test. And I want you to be thinking around leveraging, you know, the requirements gathering process as a business analyst, as a PM, or even uh, if you're in a senior stakeholder uh, group kind of figuring out what's in your portfolio and what you want to do, is what are we trying to deliver? And so this question I usually pose uh, doing requirements gatherings, could I deliver anything to you at all, provided I met these requirements? And that's kind of pushing it back on the customer, saying, you've given me the requirements. Now, you haven't given me a solution. You've given me requirements. I want to be able to deliver this. And uh, they begin to think about this a little bit harder, because if you have the freedom to deliver anything, regardless of what it is, as long as it met the requirements, then chances are uh, you may want to dig a little bit deeper, meaning you could get a solution. And I usually try and be very facetious here. Um, we had a customer one time that says, I need to have a transport, I need to transport documentation from one building to another. I need a quick way to do that. And I said, okay, well, I can do that for probably $29.95. And they said, $29.95? I said, yeah, $29.95. I'll get you a skateboard. And they're like, well, wait a minute. I said, yeah, you can just skateboard over and carry those over. And they said, well, no, that's not what we're talking about. So the requirements that you continue to push on are important to make sure that says, hey, if it's not clear, or it has to be something that's supported, things can't get wet, uh, you'll suddenly start surfacing more. And I usually tell this joke, and this is a little bit fun here, but um, there were three guys that were stranded on a desert island. And uh, as they were walking around trying to figure out how to get off of there, one of the guys fell. He actually tripped and stubbed his toe, and uh, he fell. When he got up, he saw that there was a little handle in the, in the ground. And as he began digging it out, he saw that there was a lamp. And pretty excited, pulled it out. You know, was hoping maybe it's something he can put water in. And uh, as he was dusting it off, he had this genie pop out. And the genie said, I am so excited to be let go out of my prison for a thousand years. I'm going to grant you each one wish. And the first guy said, oh, I want to be a millionaire, and I want to be up in England, and I'm, I want to have uh, fame and fortune. And so the genie, poof, made him disappear. He's over in England, fame, fortune. And the second guy says, you know, I miss my wife and kids. I really want to be back home. Poof, he's back home. The third guy, being a little bit more cautious, thought for a second, says, you know, I really miss those other two guys. <laughs> yeah. Poof, they're back on the <laughs> island, right? <laughs> so anyway, can I deliver anything to you provided it met these requirements? Inherently be thinking to make sure you haven't missed something. So with that, this is kind of the methodology portion of the session here. Bob, did you want to add anything before we hop into demo? Yeah, you know they ate that third guy first, right? <laughs> <laughs> they did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do now is a transition, and Bob's going to kind of walk us through some key components in Visio. I think this is exciting to see how the tool can help make this work for you guys. So, Bob, yeah. if you want to take control here. I will take control. Um, change presenter. Okay, so we should be looking at Visio, and I'm hopeful that Tim or Ann are going to come running in here and hit me in the head if you guys can't see Visio. It looks great. All right, awesome. Um, so what we have up on the screen is a series of templates that come out of the box in Microsoft Visio, and you can see we have a timeline template and a basic flow chart. We have an org chart. There's a cross-functional flow chart. We're going to do a demo on that one. Sometimes that's called a swim lane. Uh, we have a workflow diagram, office layout, UML class, there's a home plan, there's a floor plan, there's a whole bunch of these in here, um, and each one of them has its own use and it can be useful in many ways for developing requirements. So let's dig into uh, the cross-functional flow chart and build a swim lane. While Bob's loading that, just to let you guys know, there are some really killer vi uh, templates in the Visio library, and so you can certainly go download, Microsoft keeps updating those. Uh, but the idea is that you do not have to start from scratch. And if you're doing requirements that falls in one of these categories, just go grab the template. It's a great place to start with. Go ahead, Bob. 
Okay, so we've got a cross-functional flowchart here, and it's got two lanes. Right? And then over here on the side is the toolbar that has all of the little, what do they call? They're called shapes, and I don't know if they have a formal thing. Uh, so here's one that's called a process, and it's basically a square. And then we have a diamond, and diamonds are always for decisions. And then we have a, come on, tooltip, a subprocess. And then we have this kind of an oval. Oval always marks a start and an end. I like to make them red. I like green for start and red for end. Uh, here we have a data sheet, a document. And here we have data. And then we also have additional swim lanes. So if we want to make more, we can add to it. So these are the tools and the, the um, shapes that Visio has. So Visio works with shapes. There's a little arrow here that expands out the shapes window. And there's a bazillion shapes. There's brainstorming, business processes, charts and graphs. Under engineering, there's electrical, mechanical, and process. Under flowchart, look at that. There's 20 of them. Uh, there's five or six under general. I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, you could spend a whole entire lifetime learning all of the shapes that are available in Visio. We are going to focus on the cross-functional flowchart shapes today. Going back to here. So I'm going to add a process to my flowchart. And that is not particularly visible. So we're going to blow up the screen to something that you can see. How about that? So I just added a process to my flowchart. And now I need to have a name for my process. So we're going to call this, um, we're going to build out a timesheet process. So we're going to call this first process log into system. All right. And so who's going to do that? So up here, we're going to have a function. And for my function, it's going to be employee. And then my other function over here is going to be system. And so basically what I'm doing here is I'm building a flowchart that documents uh, when does the employee do things and when does the system do things. And for the title, I'm going to have timesheet process. And so the first thing the employee has to do is they have to log into the system. And then I'm going to have the system do something. And so the system is going to process login, right? And that's important. So we've got two, two processes now. We've got an employee doing one step, and we've got a system doing a second step. And then we can add a third step under system. So basically, drag and drop the shape, or you can click and pull down the control key and drag it over. Uh, right. It's it's a uh, in, in fact you can see the little alignment arrows that will help you as well as resizing and uh, putting your shapes together. One of the, the parts of that is that this pictorial description will help people identify as you present it to your stakeholders. Hey, uh, we forgot this group. Oh, they actually have an input. Are we missing something? And so we see a lot of these start to um, uh, build. And it, Bob's got one page at the bottom here. Sometimes we actually will clone the pages and we'll actually have multiple layers, meaning that we'll have uh, multiple pages for each group kind of adding and removing uh, elements and then begin putting those together. Go ahead, Bob. Sure. And I can keep adding process blocks. So I've added navigate to time tracking. So I made some assumptions that it's a much larger application. Uh, and then I'm going to put in enter time. <clears throat> now scroll down because I need a little bit more room for additional processes. And you know we've all done timesheets, so it would we could all build this process. And then you submit your time, and and I'll bet when you submit your time, it's going to go into the system. And then the system's going to verify time. Right, And so I don't have any arrows. Nobody actually knows from which box to which box to go to. So I need to go up and add a palette. So I need to add general blocks. And look at all of those connectors that are there. A whole lot of choices. Uh, partial layer. The connector that I want is, is it that one? It's the dynamic connector. And so when I drag this out, it gives me, it automatically connects on one side of the box. It'll connect at the top and the bottom and the right and the left. And it gives me an arrow. And the arrow points to which direction it should, it should go. And the really nice thing about the dynamic connectors is if you move things around, like if I move this box, it'll automatically move the arrow for me. And that's a really nice feature of Visio. And so we're going to add some arrows. 
to go from box to box. So after you process the login, you, the employee needs to navigate to the time, tra time tracking screen, and then the employee needs to enter their time, and then the employee needs to submit their time, and then the final or the next process is scrolling down. The system needs to verify the time, and so we've built pretty quickly in about five minutes a process flow that defines what does an employee do and what does a system do. And the reason we do that is later on we'll put some details into each one of these blocks and we'll probably capture that in, in Microsoft Word about what's actually going to happen in the system and then we can hand that off to developers who actually go build the system that will do this. What's kind of interesting is a lot of times we'll take these uh, diagrams, ob obviously usually in the upper right hand corner or upper left hand corner, we'll actually put a number, right? So it's this one, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 think of it like a work breakdown structure where literally we're breaking down the elements and then as Bob says we have a full word document or there might be supporting documentation where you have you know detailed diagrams that are just kind of digging into that. So it allows you at a glance to ensure you can kind of go, hey, here's what's going on. If you need more details, you can drill into it. And we do that in our technical project management class. We do that in our uh, uh, regular project management classes that will label the workflow steps because there are tools and templates and things that refer to a charter, uh, but people can quickly follow where they are at in the uh, flow process. Yeah. So now i got to have a decision box. So I'm going to grab the decision, which is a diamond. I'm going to put that in there. And my decision is validation criteria met and then it's because it's a decision it's always got a question mark on it All right I don't like the way it looks but we'll fix that later and we'll go back over here to blocks and we'll grab the dynamic connector and so it goes from verify time down to here. Now sometimes, uh, a lot of times I'll just open one of these that I have existing already that already has blocks and arrows in it and I won't even use the, the shapes from the palettes and I'll just copy and paste things because they've already got all the shapes I like to use and then I can just post them and do things like this. Um, and so for my validation criteria, it did not meet validation. I only put in five hours and I'm supposed to put in 40 and and I hit submit and so it you know in real life we'd have to outline what's going to happen when that happens but right now we're just talking it through with a with a manager or a user they're going to say well it doesn't meet the validation criteria so it has to go back to enter time right and so this is kind of a, um, a front end process that you use with your end users to get out of them what is it they want the system to do and then back to Tim's uh, point about the five whys or going into his three questions, we'd, we'd have to dig into each of these. What does verify time look like? What is the validation criteria? One of the things that uh, we certainly get into in terms of uh, breaking in the details, and just for those of you that are working in, you know, kind of the technology environment, is that, believe it or not, these physio diagrams, of course, have a tremendous amount of data that actually is stored waiting to be to leverage. And so we can take pictorially this view, literally hand it over to a developer, and they can plug code or non, uh, they don't even have to write code, you can plug event models around this in SharePoint. So Visio designing to work with SharePoint, especially in 2013, is that you actually can say build the diagram, not only hand it to the tech teams, but uh, it doesn't require a developer anymore. You can say, well, let me start taking these objects, I'll import it into my workflow process, and I will start uh, literally uh, you know, creating a events uh, around that in workflow, as well as uh, being able to uh, just kind of present graphically on a page, you know, where something's at. So imagine having this flow chart, and what it's doing, it's monitoring data that's being updated. Now that data could be coming from lots of different data sources, and I know that uh, Ken and some of our other team have presented on this, but the idea is imagine your picture speaks that, uh, you know, here's the, you know, what we're trying to define, not only requirements gathering, but now we can also plug it, program it, and then use the same visuals to help people go and see where the status of something is. Oh, it's been validated, it's been entered, and so they can see that process dynamically changing, you know, on a web page. All right, so I added a couple more things here. I added a process time block for the system to do things, and I added a yes arrow, and you might have noticed when I copied my arrow from up above and put it in, it automatically sized it to hit right onto the box, which is a really nice feature of Visio. It makes it a lot easier. Um, I'm going to show one more thing. Up here there's a menu for cross-functional flowchart. You may not want your flowchart to go uh, up and down. You may want it to go horizontally. Um, and I'm going to change it to horizontal. 
and it's going to show it horizontally. And it's best to do that early on because when you do it after you put a bunch of blocks with arrows on your chart, Visio goes in and it tries to automatically move them around for you, but it always comes out messy and kind of ugly like this, and then you end up spending 15 or 20 minutes fixing all the arrows. Um, so put a little thought into your cross-functional flowchart before you do it so that you know which way you want it to go and which way it looks best to the users. But you might not know up front and you may just have to fix the arrows. Um, so let's go look at the end product. The end product looks like this. We have a timesheet process, we have an actor, we have an employee, we have a system, we have a manager. So we have three actors here. Uh, we have a login to the system, it's going to process the system, we're missing an arrow that's supposed to go between there to there, the arrow got put over here on accident, probably when I switched it around. Um, enter time, submit time, verify time, validation criteria met, yes, no, notifies the manager now, manager logs into the system, now the manager's going to check the criteria, again you have a yes, no, um, this should be notify employee, not manager. And then it goes, uh, and that's the end of the process there. Or if it's no, it goes up here and goes back into enter time. And we can keep adding swim lanes and have other actors. You know, we could have a third actor for go to payroll, and, and then we could outline the steps that payroll has to do with the timesheets. And so you can have, you can probably fit five swim lanes on a die on a on a sheet of paper, maybe six if you make the boxes kind of small. So let's jump in and look at a wireframe. So Bob, maybe uh, just to talk a little bit about what you found wireframes helpful for. Yeah, so I use wireframes for outlining what's going to be on a screen when I'm developing some kind of a, a software tool like a web page or a, oh, I didn't want to do that, I wanted to do new, sorry. I can't think and, and, and move the, uh, on the menus at the same time. So I use wireframes to identify uh, what kind of fields need to be on a screen for a tool that's got screens. So in a traditional uh, application development environment, you've got a screen, a user needs to enter data. What, where, what is the data that you want to collect? Where is it going to sit? The users often have opinions about what that screen should look like and how it should flow and where the data should fit. Uh, generally, you want to have the most important data, this, the data that they touch the most often, and kind of really close to each other so they can just hop in and do three or four steps and then move out of the screen. And then you may have on the periphery data that they don't touch very often. And you can use that for any kind of screen. It can be used for a web page. It can be used for a client server application. Um, so we're going to go look at a wireframe. And we're going to find the wireframe template. There it is. And so you can see it looks like a screen. It's going to ask us what kind of uh, units we want. If we're in Europe, we can be in metrics for our European partners. And again, we've got a series of menus. Or, and in shapes. We have a menu bar, we have a menu bar item, we have a drop down menu, menu selector. Uh, there's a whole bunch of little things over here that you can use to, to tell the developer who's going to go and develop this screen what, what things happen. You know, are they supposed to edit? Is there supposed to be an open and a copy? I like the little floppy disk that they have for save. Who uses floppy disks anymore? I wonder when that'll get changed to something else, right? Is that going to be changed to the Dropbox logo at some time in the future? <laughs> Who knows? Um, I have got to find... So up here we have forms. So I'm going to build an application form. Now, I want to change the orientation, so I'm going to go up to the design menu, and I'm going to change the orientation to landscape, because if you're like me, your monitor is probably in landscape mode, and you're going to develop your application in landscape mode. And so, I've grabbed the application form. There's also a dialog form. The dialog form would be like a question box that they need to respond to, or an alert message, uh, like required data, required not valid or something to that effect, right? So that's a dialog box versus an application is much bigger and kind of shows the whole screen. You know, what's funny is um, our, uh, our if I brought our development team in here, uh, they love getting uh, diagrams. They love getting a pictorial view of what people are trying to accomplish. Um, however, when we usually go and say, hey, could you mock this up? 
they'll actually go into you know vb.net and they'll just start building it. Um, they won't put any code behind the forms or the interfaces, uh, but they also come back as the fact that uh, it's actually sometimes faster to just say, look, I can certainly build and mock it up in the environment and show you it, but Visio, without having to know how to be a developer or a programmer, gives you all of the pictures, the tools, the spinners, the drop down, the check boxes. You can quickly model and mock that up. So in many cases, we kind of go back and forth pictorially between the same type of views that you might see somebody mocking it up in, say, hey, here, I'm actually just going to create a form in the application I'm going to build. But they're always coming back to Visio going, oh, there's other things that we need. So having this interaction uh, with your, uh, your stakeholders, very helpful, especially if you are not going to be going to .NET editing a form. Uh, this gives you kind of a common platform to work from. Right, and so this is really awesome if you've got your dev team in India and they're going to go and build it overnight while you're sleeping, you can build out what does your screen going to look like and you can write little notes on it, I need to do all this and you can send that off to them and then, like Tim said, you wake up the next morning and there's a working demo that you can go play with, right? Um, so let's add some labels. So I clicked on controls up here under shapes and I'm going to add some labels and I'm going to put a label in here and it's going to be called name. Oops, I've got the caps lock key on. And I'm going to add another label. And it's going to be address. And so we're going to build a customer contact form, if you will. Um, and then we need text boxes because labels are great, but we actually want to capture the text, right? And so it's important to tell the developer, capture text here. And I might put in <clears throat> some actual text. and doesn't really look like anything, but this actually gives you quite a bit of information. Uh, I don't want to put in my address. I want you to even contact us here at Advisacon. Don't come to my house. I do have a pool. Maybe you want to come over, uh, but you have to bring the beer. Um, so we've got an address, and what else do we want to have on here? Let's do a drop-down menu. So we're going to grab a list box, and we're going to put that right here. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to ask our users what their favorite dessert is. And I just had a peppermint milkshake. I like to go hiking. And after you go hiking and climb a mountain, it's really great to go and get a milkshake. And there's this place here called Mike's that has like a choice of 35 different milkshake flavors. <clears throat> and I like the peppermint milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to choose when there's 35 flavors. <laughs> Banana cream pie. I haven't had one of those in a long time. And then up here, we're going to call this dessert. <clears throat> um, so we've quickly built a lot of information here, right? We've told the developer that we need a... <clears throat> oh, I didn't want that to say dessert, but I'll leave it there. I actually wanted a label that said dessert. So we've quickly captured a whole bunch of information. We've given the developer the names of the labels, what these fields look like. They know this is an address, and most of them have seen an address before, so that tells them what kind of information they're going to need to collect. Um, they know they're going to need to collect name information, and, and that tells them that they're, you know, they're going to need 100 characters, data maybe 50. Um, this drop-down tells them that they've got to build some kind of a table that holds the values for these drop-downs. Um, they'll want to ask the question of, well, can people add to the drop-down or is it fixed? Can they only select from these? Um, and so and you, and what often you find on these screens is you find a text box with lots of little notes that says, when the user does this, this and such and such happens, right? You know, a lot of times we'll see right-click. Um, what, you know, what's real interesting is you move into Office 365. If this is actually saved and published into uh, Office 365, you can actually have multiple people in this app at the same time making comments, edits, and changes. So you literally can be watching dialogue and conversation happen as people are kind of tuning and tweaking it. So if you have teams that are not local or they're, they're in different places, you literally can be working directly. Uh, in the same file at the same time, and you can see the comments. It's like version control, and it allows you to kind of do major and minor revisions directly with multiple people in the same document in Visio. So very nice. So over here under shapes, we have toolbars, and I just grabbed the menu toolbar, and it added three menus. And so I'm going to have a home menu. It takes me back to the start, and I'm going to have a customer menu. And so currently we're working on the customer page. And then let's say I'm going to have an order history menu, right? So this is part of a larger application that we're building. And so I'm going to tell the developer, well, this is what the customer page looks like, but I get to build out the menu and, and, and show them what they have. 
so that's a wireframe. Oh, I didn't give it an application title. So we might have called this the customer info page. And so now everybody knows what we're building here. And we could put in some notes and grab text boxes and things. Let's go look at the end product. You know, a lot of uh, people will have, you know, have PowerPoint experience and they'll go out and try and mock up something in PowerPoint, but I quickly find that when you're really trying to get the good requirements gathering that uh, the layout and the tool pieces in Visio with a little bit of training of how to drag and align, looking at the resizing handles, um, you can create a much more accurate picture. You have all the tools. You don't have to kind of fiddle or fudge. It's, it's all embedded in here in the stencils and the style sheets that are available in Visio. Right, so here we built a contact form. We've got name, address, city, state, zip code. We, we've asked for a website. Um, we've got there are little dessert things so we can find out what Tim's favorite dessert is. I'm sure it's key lime pie. <laughs> we've got a note section and we've entered some information. And Tim's an awesome customer and he invited me to his barbecue last Friday. We had chocolate chip cookies and, and this tells the developer a lot of information, right? I need to have a way to collect these kinds of notes in here. And, and by the look of it, the, there could be a lot of notes. So this needs to be a really big field. Um, and we haven't specified any correct requirements here at a level that lets them go and build that, but we've given them enough information that they can now start asking really intelligent questions, right? And we've done this in a visual way that a user can see, and, and a lot of people are visual, and they, they know what they want, they know what it looks like, but they can't tell you in words the specification. So you're basically helping them build a picture that lets them, it lets you elicit from them what the specification is. Right, and so they may really have an opinion on whether it's city and state next to each other and zip code at the bottom or all three in a row with a really big address line across the top. Um, they may want name is one field. They may want it broken out by first name, last name, middle, middle initial, those kinds of things, right? Um, it just depends on the kind of application and how they plan to use the data. And they may not know. Sometimes you have to come in and say, well, here's what I've seen in the past and, and here's the pros and cons of doing name as, as a concatenated field. You can't sort easily on last name, right? Do you need to do that? So that's kind of a question you can have. Again, some of it, uh, we talk about functional, non-functional requirements, like so maybe spacing does matter, right? Maybe color does matter, how it's aligned. You know, while that may not be a showstopper from the application actually working, um, it, it absolutely might be a showstopper for uh, a non-functional requirement. So uh, we, we think agile, right? So the idea is to have as, as an agile conversation, to have iterative discussions, and if you're spending a lot of times doing very formal requirements gathering, you know, a sea of text and bullets, not any anywhere near as clear as showing something pictorially. Yeah. So we're kind of curious what kind of tools you guys use for requirements gathering. I think we have a poll. Anna, can you put up our poll? All right. So let us know what you guys use for requirements gathering. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's uh, <laughs> we probably push with the word the other there, but uh, yeah, we'd love to know what you guys are using currently as you go through doing your requirements gathering process. You know what you're using. So go ahead and click on the box or click on multiple boxes if you have Let multiple you napkins you use. Hey Bob, can you see that that organizers and panelists can't vote <laughs> on there? I don't see that. Okay, because <laughs> we can't vote. Oh, no skewing the data. We're going to vote for our Visio. Is that what we were decided? <laughs> or were we going to vote for a napkin? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so our audience today, um, large group today, uh, uh, wow, look at Excel. Not well, No surprise there, right? So we got some Visio folks. Whiteboard, still my favorite. I think I get yelled. No napkins. Oh, I'm so disappointed. Uh, Bob, is that what you were expecting? Um, no napkin, huh? Well, maybe not in this crowd. Maybe that's a different group that's doing their requirements gathering by napkin, right? That's the, that's the CIO and the, the CEO. They sit down and work up a business deal over a napkin at the country club, right? Whatever gets the requirements process started. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. Well, let's take some questions. I know we have a few minutes here, so uh, be a good time just kind of open this up for questions. Again, for those of you uh, attending today, there is a uh, poll window which you can type in, so do uh, enter your questions. 
Anna, we've got any uh, questions waiting for us? Yeah, uh, let's kick this off with, can I show a Gantt chart in Visio? Yes, you can show a Gantt chart in Visio. Great question. Great question. Let's just pop over to Visio and see if we can look at one. Oh, let's see, file. Is it going to do it? New. I thought there was a template for Gantt chart. If you see it, Tim, yell out loud. Gantt chart. Look at that. It's got a built-in template. I can create it. And it's going to ask me a bunch of questions. How many tasks? What's the format, months, and days? I'm just going to click OK. It's going to go ahead and create a Gantt chart for me. And that's a bit of an eye chart, I think. Can you mm -hmm. guys see it? Or we'll expand out my window. And so here we go. We've got tasks, we've got start, we've got finish, we've got duration, and we've got dates. And what do you know? You could actually tie this into Gantt charts in Microsoft Project and have it feed this and make a nice visual Gantt chart that your executive might find more colorful and friendly looking. Uh, Visio's got a little bit more presentation options than Microsoft Project does. Yeah, I think you talk about performance tool. This isn't the relational database, but you can tie these. Like, for example, if you go over duration and uh, change that to, say, three days, uh, from a visual perspective, the idea is, remember, all of these shapes in the shape sheet, we can connect data to anything. Um, uh, it, it's a presentation layer. Uh, one of the nice things about this, if certainly if you're not using, say, Microsoft Project or Project Online or Project Server, is you know normally you just hit publish in that environment. Your schedule is in a browser, basically in a web browser, and you can view that. Uh, but Visio, same thing. If you're pulling your data from different data sources, you could stick that on a SharePoint page, and people can go and visualize that. That's a good question. Yeah. Anna? Yep, here we go with another one. Is an old tool for requirements and trade-offs called QFD, otherwise known as Quality Functional Deployment, used in any circles anymore? I have never heard of it. How about you, Tim? QFD, wow, I have. Um, I'm not sure, again, that's, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if people are using that. I'm sure if it's something that's old school, there's plenty of us using as many different tools uh, available. Was yeah, there more to the question? <laughs> Other than just, uh, or have we seen uh, seen people using that in circles now? Yep, I think it's more validation, seeing if it's still in use. Well, again, I look at best practices around, you know, if you're doing best practices, in some cases, you know, we're showcasing Visio. Uh, earlier in the slide deck, I was showing relational databases and program cards and, uh, you know, traceability matrices that are in Excel. But the idea is um, you're going to find a tool of creating visuals uh, are, are important. It's the process around it, I think, that uh, really you want to reinforce. That's a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go dig into that now. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Uh, one last one. It looks like we did get a little clarification. Apparently, QFD was really big in HP. So that might help you, Tim, think about previous experiences running into that. Um, but to move on to our last question, given the time, uh, why is it called a swim lane in Visio? It's called a swim lane because it looks like a swimming pool, and it's a lane, and people move up and down the lane, and sometimes they switch from one lane to another. And so, it, and it's much easier to say swim lane than it is to say cross-functional diagram or whatever. It's a cross-functional flowchart. <clears throat> it just sounds more friendly, right? Well, kudos to Visio for being very literal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've heard them called functional uh, bands. Uh, there's just different flavors that we've we've seen that. Um, let's see, uh, Rumler Brachi diagrams. Goodness gracious, there's all kinds. Of, oh, some of the stuffs are kind of spilling out of my head here. Um, what's kind of fun, just to leave you guys a quick an overview, is that when Microsoft uh, realized that there was a definite gap in the marketplace, they went and acquired Visio. They bought it. And um, for those of you that uh, follow Visio, there's a gentleman named Chris Hopkins, uh, just brilliant. Uh, but he came over in the acquisitions, been working with Microsoft uh, for you know many, almost, almost 20 years now. Uh, but has uh, he's still there working with the Visio team? He just knows so much about that product, and uh, he's got some great blogs, great posts. I recommend taking a look at some of these. Okay, well, let's kind of summarize, and uh, we'll kind of uh, wrap up here. So, again, going back to methodology, um, remember, follow a process. You're going to be moving through an elicitation. We need to identify 
uh, obviously our stakeholders align what the requirements are to uh, the organizational priorities. In many cases, if you look at the elicitation you're starting with, who are the stakeholders? Who do I need to talk to? Um, a lot of times I get questions that come up that says, well, how do I handle lots of stakeholders, lots and lots of stakeholders? Well, that may mean there's a lot of documentation, but sometimes you think about that in terms of using uh, an approach where you, you nominate an elective, right? So if you think about the United States, right, we're, we're not necessarily a, uh, we talk about uh, are we a democracy where it's one vote, one person, or are we a republic where you have elected representatives go? And so with an electoral college and yet we have votes, it's kind of this hybrid blend between the two, is that with your stakeholders, you can elect a stakeholder representative to come and bring the requirements. And that person will go back and they become part of your team, you're extending in eliciting and, and document your requirements. And so helping them with these type of tools are good. So again, analyzing, moving through, asking your triplet questionings, you know, what is your requirement? Uh, what of value does that give you? So important to, to get in there. And again, remember, what we're after is to get to the real requirement versus a just high-level solution from that. Uh, finally, of course, your documentation, verify, and then uh, we didn't talk about the manage process, but it is important to manage your requirements, make sure that they are done, they aren't constantly changing, uh, but that verification, documentation, and analyze, those three components in the middle, this is an excellent place to use visual diagrams, and we, especially as we deal with the complex projects, the pictures speak a thousand words, they really do help. And so, again, leveraging that. So lock, lock into the tools that make sense to you. Uh, we showed today Visio and a few other snapshots of other tools that you can use, but the idea is model your complex requirements. Put them out there. It becomes a much more agile and interactive process. Bob, anything you want to expand upon uh, on some of our summary today? Oh, I just want to reiterate that Visio has awesome templates, right? <laughs> <laughs> I use them all the time. Yep. Crazy. Uh, so we have a development team here and we can develop all kinds of great stuff for customers, uh, but my job is often sitting between what the customer wants and, and getting the information to our dev team so they can build it and I use Visio a lot just to, a customer will come and say, I want to build out a workflow that will do this and this and this and this and, and they'll hand me an Excel template and, and, and I'll look at it and it's got a lot of great information in it, but it might not actually have any workflow in it. And, and so then, well, where, how does the work actually flow? Who does what? So I, I, I'll dig up Visio to figure that out. <laughs> we tend to find that as you begin to map your processes, as you begin diagramming what needs to be built, it forces other stakeholders to emerge. And remember, one of the things that I, I usually teach in some of our classes, and I know, Anna, I've got to give you a couple minutes to close, uh, but I just wanted to say that... Uh, uh, clearly, um, you do not want to have a stakeholder that is surprised. It, it is inevitable you will disappoint some stakeholders, but never, never, never surprise stakeholders. And a stakeholder who wasn't included in the initial process is going to be very surprised when suddenly, hey, there's a project and nobody talked to me. So culturally, we talk about culturally making things uh, acceptable. This is a great tool. Uh, Visio is a great product to help make that process happen. Yeah, and if you hand them a 30-page Word document, there's a really good chance they're not going to read it. But if you hand them a two-page Visio, there's a really good chance they'll look at it, right? And it might have all the same information. And that Excellent. just gets back to that picture is really got, you can convey a whole lot of information in a picture that you, that's really hard to outline in a, in a document. Fantastic. All right, uh, Anna, back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks so much for sharing uh, your time and expertise this morning with us. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it, and hopefully the rest of the attendees did as well. And speaking of the attendees, thanks to you guys uh, for hopping on and checking out what we have to offer for this hour. Really quickly, I'm going to summarize our next steps with this. We want to hear from you, and we're not going to charge you. We're not going to lock you in. We obviously enjoy this stuff. If you couldn't tell from Bob and Tim's banter today, uh, we'd be doing this if you didn't pay us. So no reason to feel intimidated or stay away. Whatever is of interest or of need to you, we want to go ahead and engage. Uh, last closing comments, uh, as you know, this session qualifies for a free PDU. Uh, in order to be eligible to claim that, please fill out the short five-question survey that's going to appear at the close of this webinar in your web browser. Upon completion of that survey, uh, you'll be getting an email from me 
uh, hopefully by Friday uh, with the PDU number and information. If you run into any issues at all, feel free to reach out directly to myself or any one of us at the team here. And just a quick reminder, we do these sessions for you guys. So if we are hitting the mark, missing the mark, or have, uh, haven't have even discovered the mark that you need for these times to be of use, please reach out and let us know, either via that survey or pick up the phone, shoot an email, um, however is most comfortable for you. At this point, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap up and give you your day back. Again, thanks so much for sharing your time. Thanks, everyone.